the heresy of Sedevacantism and why the seat of St. Peter is not empty, this pernicious heretical diabolical lie, concocted by the enemies of the true Catholic Church, in order to help the devil, their master, to destroy the trust in the ultimate mercy of our Lord, the divine Redeemer and founder of the genuine Roman Catholic Church, and also to eliminate the necessary hope in our Lord's help to his Church, when this Holy See is attacked by such devilish fabricated lie these set of acantists heretics are very actively disseminating, but the Roman Catholic Church in her infallible doctrine, which has been long ago decreed and published as fully binding in conscience, stands protected and remains under her supreme head, which is not the excommunicated apostate layman idolater with communist connections Jorge Bergoglio, nor his quote predecessors unquote as far back as 1962 Anno Domini, but the true Vicar of Christ our Lord, this true Sovereign Pontiff, and unceasingly so, because this same divine institution Roman Catholic Church teaches it so, this publication explains the more necessary details of this doctrine and why it is that set of acantism is nothing but a diabolical heretical lie, leading souls nowhere else but to hell. The heresy of set of acantism and why the seat of St. Peter is not empty. This recording is very important because it deals with a subject that is so pressing. Because this horrible heresy is uh, truly denying the power of God, the infinite power of God. Ultimately this is true denial of the supernatural power of God. And denial, heretical denial, of his divine promise. That means of our Lord to, this, to the first Pope, St. Peter which is recorded in the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 16. It's, our Lord says, Thou art Peter upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. On in Latin, correct Latin translation will be against her, means the church. And I will give to thee, to thee, Peter, the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind upon earth shall be bound also in heavens, and whatsoever thou shalt lose on earth shall be loosed also in heavens. This is the promise of our Lord. These set of accountants are basically saying that, or denying that this promise is in force, which is horrible heresy. In that case, they also are explicitly denying the infallible doctrine of the Vatican Council under Pope Pius IX. There was only one Vatican Council in the history of the Church. We don't have two Vatican Councils, not in the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, to correctly teach this, as well those who may wonder why is it so, well by then what happened in 1962, uh, John XXIII and Joe Roncalli, he was enemy of the Church based on his, the results of his actions. Roncalli attempted to destroy the apostolic succession of the Roman Catholic Church and so he was very careful not to um, publish anything heretical prior to his 1958 election which is valid because there's no objective doubt nor, nor any kind of provable thing that would take place that would be invalidating it. Certainly there's nothing about Roncalli that would invalidate it, even though there are some conspiracy theories about him. Yet those things cannot be asserted because obviously uh, uh, just the, the, the lack of proper documents is uh, visible. There are some assertions about him being Freemasons. Freemason, he had contacts with the communists in a way but that doesn't establish his membership and so otherwise and there's a video of him being allowed to enter the conclave which by the law of the conclave which was put in place the updating law, disciplined law of the church which is in force is what is called the Vacantis Apostolicae Sedis of Pope Pius XII in point 36 this an uh, important document of the Church establishes that cardinals who are canonically deposed uh, cannot participate in a conclave, which includes also those who are heretics, thus referring to Canon 188, point number 4, 
of the 1917 Code of Canon Law, that's the only called, uh, valid code of the Church. And uh, in that it speaks about that Office of a Cleric um, becomes vacant by way of tacit resignation by the force of law and without any declaration if a cleric and uh, automatically ipso facto that means without any declaration if a cleric and point number four says has publicly defected from the Catholic faith. That's the case of Roncalli because by attempting to change these sacred rights he contradicted uh, Canon 13 or Section 7 of the Council of Trent which forbids this to be done in substantial manner so the Pope is not free to uh, change the sacraments, the sacred rites uh, used in the sacraments which the language of Council of Trent is explicit and it says let him be anathema which means cursed and excommunicated those things are bound in heaven so there's no such thing that the Pope can declare anything of a kind but Don Kali attempted that's, that's in February 28, 1962 when that happened the minute he put his signature on that decree, he ceased to be the Pope, automatically and based on a canon kind of law. Beware of assertions that are floating around the internet. Some of them are published by laymen, which is another audacity and horrifying sacrilege, because laymen had no authority to intrude into these matters. Uh, they float around and speak about uh, that uh, the canon kind of law that the Pope is above the canon kind of law. And that assertion is completely false. Now the Pope is legislator and in matters that pertain to discipline, yes he is the legislator but it is expected of him to follow what is necessary for the salvation of souls. That discipline when it reflects to, when it goes to salvation of souls, uh, uh, the Pope is expected to follow what is the principle because he cannot decree something that would hamper it or lower the, the, the safeguards that's one principle but this in regards to papacy and election to papacy or retaining uh, as the canon 188 speaks about retaining the clerk office that is no longer a matter of discipline that is member of the matter of the catholic faith and apostolic succession and use of the keys to the kingdom of heaven and that is matter of Catholic faith and doctrine which leads to salvation. In that case the Pope is not free to change that or amend it. He can add to it additional safeguards but not to contradict it and lower the safeguards. That's not possible. So this assertion of these people is only for that purpose to justify their adherence to this non-Catholic apostate sect that is occupying church, Catholic Church worldwide property. The sect is called Novus Ordo, which uses non-Catholic worship, non-Catholic ceremonies. They perverted everything there is to lay their hands on, including the sacraments. And these people are outside the church as apostates. And they have communist connections long-term communist connections and it was always the, the stress strategy of the communists including the Russian communists to destroy the church from within so um, uh, there's no, no place here to enlarge on that subject we have dealt with that subject in different recordings special recording on that subject about the communist attack against the church uh, but the, the purpose of just to establish why certificantism is a heresy and why these kind of assertions against the canon law are inadmissible and themselves denial of the, the authority of the church. Canon law has to be explained according to the mind of the legislator and the legislator in this case will put the principles forward and uh, although it was subsequently published by a successor Benedict XV uh, the legislator was and past the tent. Uh, our predecessor in happy memory and blessed memory. And uh, he, uh, in his, the, the show, his mind is recorded in the, for example, the condemnation of the modernist heresy in his encyclical Passeni Dominici Grecis, uh, which is sufficient uh, just to illustrate the testimony of the legislator. 
Point number four of Canon 188 speaks about if a cleric has publicly defected from the Catholic faith. Public heretic is ipso facto, ipso ire by the force of law, and without any declaration, separated, severed from his cleric office, cannot exercise that office. That includes the Pope. And moreover, most importantly, this is part of the revealed faith. We decree and define by our apostolic authority, and whomsoever dares to contradict this recording or this, uh, our teaching in follow doctrine that is part of the church authority to decree, that such person is anathema and severed automatically from the unity of the church as heretic. Whomsoever dares to publish something like this is automatically outside the church. It is essential to understand that uh, the principle of the keys of the kingdom of heaven belong to the Pope, but the Pope and thus dogma of the Vatican Council and the Pope Pius the, Pius the Ninth is the dogma of infallibility. So it speaks about um, that the Holy Spirit was not promised, the assistance of the Holy Spirit was not promised to the successors of St. Peter, that they may teach new doctrine, but that they infallibly, inviolably, and faithfully safeguard and protect the divine deposit of faith transmitted by the apostles. In this sense has to be taken everything else. People cannot just start explaining themselves because they adhere to this horrible sect as if that was something permissible, and it is not permissible. This, this non-Catholic sect is outside the church and does not possess this outside novus outer sect does not possess any authority in the Roman Catholic Church or any jurisdiction in the Roman Catholic Church and for that matter they do not possess because they perverted all the rights and so forth they do not possess the dignity to do so and episcopal and priestly office, clerical office for that matter of any kind within the church and only those who are ordained in true right but they are not able to exercise that office and they possess the dignity in terms of the sacrament but they cannot exercise it often. God would not help them even if they returned they will have to take everything back publicly their public heresies and scandals and everything else they will have to be absolved by none other than our person that's our office and matter of canon law Canon 2314. All heretics, apostates, and, and schismatics are ipso facto excommunicated, specially reserved, special model, it speaks about. Latai sententia ipso facto means uh, special reserved to the Holy See, this Holy See. And so we don't have any deviances from that. Those people have to be considered in indiv individual cases. If they want to be reconciled and we invite them to a serious search for uh, their conscience and uh, we invite them to repentance and amendment and conversion otherwise they're on their way to hell. A refutation of, of the uh, certificate count is heresy because it, it's clear language here. So this is again from the Vatican Council on the perpetuity of the primacy of blessed Peter in Roman Pontius. Uh, so that uh, which the Prince of Shepherds and the Great Shepherd of the Sheep, Jesus Christ our Lord, established in the person of the Blessed Apostle Peter to secure the perpetual welfare and lasting good of the Church must by the, by the same institution necessarily remain unceasingly in the Church. For none can doubt, and it is known to all ages, uh, so for that the holy and blessed Peter the prince and chief of the apostles the pillar of the faith and foundation of the Catholic Church received the keys of the kingdom of heaven from our Lord Jesus Christ the Savior and Redeemer of mankind and lives presides and just judges to this day always always to this day always please observe this to this day always and his successors, the bishops of the Holy See of Rome, which was founded by him and consecrated by his blood. That's very clear language. Whence, whosoever succeeds to Peter uh, in the sea, does by the institution of Christ himself obtain the primacy of Peter of the whole church. 
The disposition made by Incarnate Truth therefore remains, and Blessed Peter, abiding in the rock strength which he received, has not abandoned the direction of the Church. And so forth. And then this is the canon. If then anyone shall say that it is not by the institu institution of Christ the Lord or by divine right that blessed Peter has a perpetual line of successors in the primacy of the universal church or that the Roman pontiff is not the successor of blessed Peter in this primacy, let him be anathema, that means cursed and excommunicated. The circumstantial but sufficient proof of invalidity of these episcopal consecrations attempted by Archbishop Pierre Martin and Godintuk, from the mouth of the ipso facto excommunicated set of Acantist heretic Anthony C. Cata, during the 2002 quote public debate unquote about these consecrations with another ipso facto excommunicated, SSPV, heretic William Jenkins, both servants of Satan, for which evil C. Cata is already paying in hell forever. So my conclusion at a certain point there was that uh, we're obliged to regard the consecrations as valid. So what I did in 91, I uh, put all my research together in an article. You can find that on the website. And, um, and that's the point. You know, we uh, change our positions because we learn and we discover other facts. And also, I discovered that Tuck did issue a consecration certificate, in fact. And Father Kelly, remember, he used the absence as the certificate. I remember him at the meetings as the principal to impugn the validity of the Tuck consecration. He said, oh, you don't have a certificate. It's not official proof. You have to all this rigmarole and witnesses as to matter and form. No one says that, OK? Uh, it's a whole canonical rigmarole that you'd go through for an ecclesiastical trial, maybe. Right? But so then the certificate, oh, you know, you've got to have one and everything. Principal objection. Then I found one. In 92, and then he ignored it, and now started to talk about Tuck's mental state. Okay? Very simply, my position. I'll explain it to you on the validity of the consecrations. The standard procedure for verifying when someone receives a sacrament is this the priest ascertains the fact that the ceremony took place. You come, you say you've been baptized. Okay? You have a certificate. If you don't have a certificate, one can't be had. Maybe there's some other proof. Maybe there's photos of your baptism. Uh, you know, maybe there's someone who, uh, who is there who said that, yeah, the, the priest baptized you. Okay? So, did it occur? Then the minister who performed the rite, all right? Um, was he a validly ordained Catholic priest? Did the Catholic priest do it? Right? So you ask the recipient or the parents. And they'll tell you, oh, yeah, okay, sure, he was. And the rite used, did they use the traditional rite? Or the Vatican II right for a sacrament. Oh, they use the traditional right. Okay, fine. Then you conclude uh, that, um, okay, ceremony occurred, right? Validly ordained priest did it, used a traditional right, valid. No further questions. No rigmarole, special witnesses, all this other stuff. Okay, we apply that to the tuck consecrations. What you can ascertain is the fact, first of all, that the ceremonies occurred. I've got a consecration certificate, right, that attests to that. There are published photos of it, and both Gerard de Laurier's, uh, from whom Bishop Sanborn derives his apostolic succession, and Carmona's, from whom Bishop Dolan derives his, of their consecrations. It occurred from all this stuff, certificate, photos, etc. Then you have a minister who performed the rite, Tuck, okay, validly consecrated Catholic bishop. And then the right used. What right did they use? Okay? And you find out that they used the right of Episcopal consecration in the 1908 Roman Pontifical. And you know that from info I'm going to give you. There are captions published with photos of the ceremony stating that he used it. There's an interview conducted under oath with Hiller, Dr. Hiller, who was one of the men who was present, a sworn affidavit from another fellow, uh, Heller who said that Tuck used the Roman Pontifical, there was a published interview with Gerard de Laurier saying that the old uh, Pontifical was used for it, and then a second interview that Father Collins, I think, did with him, and uh, Gerard uh, again said that it was the traditional Pontifical. If you knew Gerard, um, he was a, uh, a very devout, faithful, traditional Catholic priest. Right? 
uh, and, you know, not an unreliable man. So you conclude then, so you have the fact of the ceremony, you know what rite was used, and you know that Tucker's a valid bishop. So you conclude, just as you would with any other sacrament, that uh, it occurred, validly consecrated bishop, you use the rite, bang, it's valid. Okay, briefly, what are the defects that would mess up an Episcopal consecration? Right? That would you, you would have to prove now to prove that it was doubtful or invalid. Right? Uh, but you'd have to prove uh, 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 the idea of like proving something doubtful. You, you have to find a reason for invalidity in the reality of the right. You can't just say, oh, I doubt it because I wasn't there and I think Tuck was a crazy old geezer. Okay? It doesn't work that way. You have to prove from what happened. The consecrating bishop did not impose hands. That's the matter of the sacrament. That he uh, uh, didn't pronounce the essential 16-word formula. You would have to prove that. Or he withheld his intention uh, internally to make a bishop or to do what the church does. And Louis XIII says the matter and form automatically have the correct intention. And all of our uh, normal sacramental practice presumes that the priest has the correct intention. Anyway. So to answer this, this is from the um, decrees of the Council of Trent. Um, and Session 23, Canon 4 and Canon 7. If anyone said that by sacred ordination the Holy Ghost is not given, and that vainly therefore do the bishops say, Receive ye the Holy Ghost, or that a character is not imprinted by that ordination, or that he who has once been a priest can again become a layman, let him be anathema, that means cursed, excommunicated. Canon 7. If anyone said that bishops are not superior to priests, or that they have not the power of confirming and ordaining, or that the power which they possess is common to them and to priests, and so forth, or that those who have neither been rightly ordained nor sent by ecclesiastical and canonical power but come from elsewhere are lawful ministers of the word and of the sacraments, let him be anathema. So there are several points in here. Uh, please observe what uh, was said uh, before and that this needs to be very carefully uh, acknowledged. First of all, the Canon 4 specifies and defines the essential form for that sacrament to take place. That means Episcopal or uh, Episcopal consecration or priestly ordination. These words receiving the Holy Ghost are recorded in the Holy Scripture. The part, they are part of the revealed, revealed faith and therefore they cannot be substituted by something else. And uh, so we will speak about this in subsequent section. But this is a very important part that needs to be observed that why this is so and why these enemies of the church were attempting to destroy this by asserting that this is the essential form of something else, which again, this is under the pain of anathema, that means cursed and excommunicated from the church. If anybody dares to decree something else, because it says then, if anyone says that the Holy Ghost is not given by a sacred ordination, and that vainly therefore do the bishops say, receive the Holy Ghost, that's the essential form recorded by Council of Trent. Nobody would ever dare to ascertain or uh, to introduce something else. And they tried to blame it on Pius XII that he did. But if he attempted to do so, and there's no proof of this at all, no original document that was substantiate that, that, that assertion and uh, only vaguely uh, ascertain sort of uh, uh, implication uh, implied by after two, two years after uh, Pius XII died in 1960 there's only publication that was published in, uh, um, by the so-called Jesuits in St. Mary's, Kansas uh, but they didn't specify the uh, the actual, the, the, they didn't quote the document which they were attempting to mention, so they didn't quote what exactly Pastor Twelf did. They just said that he defined uh, uh, the essential form of the sacrament of holy orders. Well, that's not sufficient, and they were afraid to do so. Why didn't they? Why they withhold that? We will show that in the subsequent part, but. Uh, and there are several other problems with that publication which proves that these people are already heretics and enemies of the church. So they all concocted this and tried to blame it on Pius XII that he somehow defined the form which is otherwise then they, he, he supposedly supposed to use the uh, what this Cicada in the previous section says 16 words form which is no this is five words receive ye the Holy Ghost 
that's the Episcopal consecration ceremony. So that's major, major problem, and that invalidates the whole ceremony uh, based on defect of intention, because those people who attempt to uh, administer the sacrament with that understanding, therefore, have defect of intention. They do not do what the church does in administering sacraments, because then their uh, the understanding of what the essential form of that sacrament is contradicts the church in fault doctrine of this Council of Trent. And that is serious defect of intention, and that's the proof that those consecrations were invalid, which we'll explain in subsequent sections. This is from a publication that was published by the SSPX Heretics, and in this is shown the ceremony of the Episcopal Consecration from 1962 on the left-hand side, and then on the, uh, from 1968, that was from Montini, the arch heretic who was never the uh, never valid pope. And then it speaks about how it is done. So, um, and this is only what they say it is, but that's not really showing the, the exact uh, understanding. Because uh, this is sort of misleading. And because it says receive the Holy Spirit, and it says the, the, then this is done. The imposition of hands is done in 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 turn, and uh, of conferring the episcopal uh, recite with the bishop consecrated co -consec bishop consecrated the prayer. Be pleased, O Lord, and all the preface and all of the preface which follows. So, in other words, yes, actually, it proves that. Uh, on the bottom of the left hand side it says uh, it says while well, saying but also it says with all the right mo at the right moment the intention of conferring the Episcopal consecration reside with the visual consecrated prayer be pleased O Lord so yes that's what it is So obviously, this is sort of misleading at that moment, but then their understanding is that on the right hand side, that's what Montini introduced, uh, this is all done in silence. That's what they have the SSPX in the priestly ordination so-called, which is invalid. But even this, that it is done in turn, the position of hands is done in turn, that invalidates the Episcopal consecration. So, um, but then their understanding was that it's the preface, and they tried to blame it on past the 12, that's coming up. This is from publication from 1960, from published in St. Mary's, Kansas, by the so-called Jesuits. And uh, on the first page of that book, it speaks about they giving thanks to people who are, who have allowed them, the printer, who allowed them to quote the Holy Scripture. So that's, that's, a, that's a major, major red flag right there who these people were. This is 1960, two, two years after Pastor 12 died. On the bottom left-hand side it says, um, The Apostle Constitution of Sacramental Ordinance, 1947. In the ancient church there is no sign of any handing over of instruments as a rite in the ordination to the diaconate and priesthood. In the Middle Ages, however, this rite was universally observed by the bishops of the Western Church in ordinations to the diaconate and priesthood and was considered by many theologians as necessary for validity. This difference in practice between the ancient church and so forth give rise to lively theological debate over the matter and form of the sacrament without giving any decision on the speculative questions involved for past 12 has definitely settled for the future that the presentation of the instruments is not necessary for the validity of these orders. Further, he determines in the Constitution Sacrament Ordinance, November 30, 1947, the matter of form for the diaconate, priesthood, and episcopate. The translation of this selection was made from the Acts Apostolica Cities, Acta Apostolica Cities, and so forth. But then, in uh, on the right-hand side, point number four, uh, we'll skip a little bit. It says, therefore, after praying for uh, this is five to twelve. 
Therefore, after praying for heavenly light, we, with our supreme apostolic authority and with certain knowledge, declare and, as far as it is necessary, decree and make provision. The matter of the holy orders of diaconate, priesthood, and episcopate is the imposition of hands, and that alone, and the form, likewise the only form, is the words determining the application of this matter, which words signify in a univocal so signify in a univocal sense the sacramental effects the power of order and the grace of the holy spirit so where is the preface this is on the on the right hand on the left hand side at the top that's a continuation of that previous page and this is from 1960 book so they were afraid to publish it what they published afterwards that proves that he he didn't ever spoke about it. So it continues, and which are understood and used by the church in this sense. That means the Holy Spirit. Hence it is that we should declare and to remove all controversies and preclude anxieties of conscience. We do declare via apostolic authority and determine, even if there ever was any different legitimate prescription, that the handing over of the instruments at least in the future, is not necessary for the validity of the holy orders of diaconate, priesthood, and episcopate. This is from Pastor 12. He doesn't speak about what the form is. David held this, and then, after certain years passed, when this was no longer necessary to be concealed, they started publishing what it was. Then they started claiming that it was the preface. This is this book is two years published two years after the death of Pastor 12. So when they, these heretics, this horrible sect, had access to what Ron Colley did, and then they tried to blame it on Pastor 12, and so, uh, and then it started progressing, and today the form is that it's done in silence, which is invalid. And so, but 16 words, uh, what this Chicago said, 16 words, uh, essential form, no, that's that's contradictory, contradictory to what the Council of Trent teaches, and evidently so here. The grace of the Holy Spirit, power of order, and the grace of the Holy Spirit, the sacramental effect, that has to be described. And the, the only way to describe this, it says, "A sipa spiritum sanctum, receive the Holy Ghost." So this is from uh, Saint Thomas Aquinas, uh, Summa Theologiae Supplementum, question. 38 article 2 where the heretics and those who are cut off from the church can confer orders and uh, this is very significant because then uh, in this what St. Thomas teaches, St. Thomas Aquinas and it's evident that this is applicable here uh, evidently so uh, in these cases is that it is not permissible to approach heretics for sacraments because there's no grace in those sacraments so we will read it uh, by the very fact up, uh, up, uh, on top, it says he goes through like three three uh, ex explanations, and the third um, uh, then um, uh, the third one is highlighted there. So it says by the very fact that a person communicates in the sacraments with a heretic who is cut off from the church, he sins and thus approaches the sacrament insincerely and cannot obtain grace. Uh, except perhaps in baptism in case of necessity when a person is dying wants to be baptized want to become Catholic and that's baptism desire so that's a different question hence others say that they the heretics they confer the sacraments validly but do not confer grace with them not that the sacraments are lacking in efficacy but on account of the sins of those who receive the sacraments from such persons despite the prohibition of the church this is the third and the true opinion and then it speaks a reply to objection one. It says, the effect of absolution, in confessional that is, is nothing else but the forgiveness of sins which results from grace. And consequently, a heretic cannot absolve, as neither can he confer grace in, in the sacraments. Moreover, in order to give absolution, it is necessary to have jurisdiction, which one who is cut off from the church has not. Um, then well, it says those who are ordained by heretics, although they receive an order, provided it's all valid, which today is another question which we will deal in subsequently. They receive not the exercise thereof uh, as, so as to minister lawfully in their orders for the very reason indicated in the objection, which means the, the, they are, that they are cut off from the church, they don't have the permission from the church to exercise that clerical office which is reflected in the count of 188. 
Tassi's resignation, which forbids those people who are heretics, point number four, uh, who they basically are uh, uh, separated, severed from that clerical, uh, clerical office, and they cannot exercise it. Today, the situation is much worse. So this regarding their uh, invalid, um, invalid orders because of those defects that are present. God permits those defects to exist precisely because these people are his enemies. And so our Lord make, is making sure by those defects that the, they will not obtain valid holy orders, period. He needed to be exercised, you know, no question about that. I would think that being possessed by the devil is the a, is a worst evil that could uh, uh, be, uh, befall anyone. I didn't know what to expect. And when you enter in a realm of the unknown, you're obviously very, very scared. The exorcism was performed in the church, in Latin. Ramsey was strapped into a chair. There were six bodyguards with stun guns to protect the priest. If the Lord permitted, the devil could easily uh, kill the exorcist. As I proceeded with the prayers, he didn't seem to be himself. It was just some other person were, were, were taking over him, uh, he himself seemed, seemed to go, almost go into a kind of a, of a daze. I remember him coming to me, at me with that stole, placing it on my head, and it's as if he'd hit me with a, a hammer almost, because I just did not know anything after that. Speak, devil, be gone, gone in the name, name of God. God. Uh, leave him alone. Go back to hell where he came, came from. from. Be gone. gone. Then the hands clawed in such a manner that no human hand could claw like that. He had begun to make the signs of the cross on his forehead and on his breast, and then he would, uh, he would, he would violently react and you know, slap his hand at me, and, and he snarled like, a, like an animal. The lips rolled up, the teeth protruded, and he tried to fight. How, How many, many of you are there ready to come, ready to come from? from? What keeps you here? Be gone, Satan. Leave him alone, alone, alone. When the devil did leave him, uh, he came to himself. As I came out the exorcism, you feel that you're a new person. The man was freed. The man was freed. I felt I wanted to kiss him, kiss Bishop McKenna, because what he'd done. So to address, uh this point. Uh, in the previous excerpt, you have seen somebody whose name is Robert McKenna. He died in 2015, based on the uh, uh, information published. And um, this is the so called consecrated of another set of privationist heretic. Set of vacantist, set of privationist heretic. Uh, Donald J. Sanborn. And Sanborn, that's the object of our interest to portray these people who they truly are. These are actually enemies of the church. So in that video, that's the only one we were able to obtain regards to visible what the chapel looks like. And in that video is priceless because it shows that he has instead of cross that needs to be on the, on the front face of the altar on the antipendium because the altar represents the, cr the cross of Calvary during the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. Those who don't know that, those who have something else, they are heretics. It's a heresy. To have a representation of the Last Supper invites the Protestant heresy of the Last Supper. But that's not, that's not the case. That was never the case. We have visited churches in Europe, there were old churches, now in the hands of the, of the sect. And the, when they retained the altar, the altar retained the, the cross. That's it. All of them, every single one of them that were all left, they had the cross, nothing else. Uh, so um, that's what needs to be on there. Because that sacrament has to signify what the sacrament is supposed to affect. That's a required part of the what the um, what, what the sacrament is supposed to be. That means the holy sacrifice of mass. On that principle rests the, the principle of episcopal consecration and priestly ordination. Because if that uh, ordaining bishop or a consecrating bishop attempts to administer the sacrament with the 
uh, knowledge that the chapel of that person or his own chapel, his own church, contains these kind of uh, essential errors, uh, then uh, that's a defect of intention, that that person is not sincere in front of God, and that's the church, ha the, the person has to do what the church does in administering the sacraments. Not only in that right, but what is essential to demonstrate that that's a true Catholic right. And in that case, to have a, a representation of last supper in your own chapel and, and do the consecration somewhere else, that's a, that's a defect of intention from God. And that invalidates the sacrament. Uh, so we have some more picture references to, Ar to Archbishop Ngo which is uh, more striking, it's very hard, there's, there's a picture, this uh, McKenna was supposedly consecrated by another separationist heretic on whom uh, they speak about that uh, he was supposedly uh, uh, confessor of Pius XII and, and these kind of things, high level, so to establish his credibility, but the false heretical theory that's violating the teaching of the Council of the Vatican uh, of the material possession, that's a heresy, of material possession of the papacy, which this horrible theory of this Gerard de Laurier's grants, which is espoused, was espoused by McKenna and subsequently by this Donald J. Sanborn. Uh, it grants the uh, position of that uh, to this non Catholic novice of the sect, but they do not have possession of any authority within the church. That's visible in the canon law and the church doctrine and, and divine law. And it's part of the revealed faith. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. So uh, this theory is heretical. as fully condemned by the authority of the church. On that video that we were able to obtain, there's a, there's a screenshot, we took a screenshot, it's posted here. Uh, of this Gerard de Laurier was published in 1979. He was supposedly consecrated by Archbishop Ngo in 1981. Archbishop Ngo, the, it says actually because these people are prepared for these kind of questions so he supposedly made him re renounce it but then it kind of continued but that's not, the, that's, that's, not, that's not the main guiding principle. The main guiding principle is who these people are that they are excommunicated heretics. Every single one of them. Archbishop the God was present in the Second Vatican Garden of Heretics. And on top of it, and this is the, the point that invalidates or at least gives objective doubt about validity of that of those consecrations. Not only the defect of intention whom he was attempting to consecrate, that he actually went to old Catholic sect and so forth, which casts a really serious doubt about either his mental state or and the, the sect of the Palmar de Troya in, in Spain. At face value, he uh, attempted to ordain them to priesthood and uh, then subsequently to episcopate people who were laymen, they had no training on whatsoever in, in uh, ecclesiastical training, they just uh, presented some kind of uh, a story about uh, a blessed mother appearing or something like that in that case and it's so fantastic in its essence and this, this, but this is not what the church does but the main thing is now there's a video there's a there's a there's not actual uh, what is available on the internet is not this Chicada was saying what well, they are the during that ordination or the episcopal consecration so-called they are pictures, so it's, you can see this, the, uh, the Ponti Roman, Roman Pontifical and so forth. And, but we haven't been able to find any such pictures. We're not doubting that they exist, but the, the defect of intention is this, their understanding what the essential form is. So what this Chicago was saying that they regard as the 16, what the Roncalli instituted, 1962, uh, 
and what they tried to blame on Pilot 12, that's 1947. Uh, we have demonstrated that that's, that's a complete fabrication because there's no original document, how come? They have access to the Vatican, they have access to these documents, how come this is not published? Uh, if uh, Pilot 12 did that, he would be contradicting the Council of Trent, he demonstrated that. So, now, so anything that they come up with is therefore heretical and that means if they have such understanding uh, that means that they do not regard uh, what the church does in the administration of the sacrament that is serious defect of intention on their part and therefore it, it also invalidates the ceremony itself. Now in regards to Archbishop of God since he permitted such people to, uh, uh, to uh, be uh, to allow them to obtain the episcopal consecration who were written with heresy and by canon law that's another point very important by canon law all heretics are excommunicated ipso facto special reserves to the holy see now Archbishop God regarded the, the sect for one way or another as, uh, as in charge, but that's not the case. Uh, no other sort of sect. Uh, so then they cannot be reconciled with the sect because that's a false religion. So then he was the one who was heretic and they were heretics. He accepted them for consecration. That means there's no grace of the sacrament. He was heretic so they, can, they cannot confer graces in the sacrament. Uh, and moreover, the defect of intention is that he was silent about about their regard of the uh, fraudulent form, which is not the form of the sacrament. And that invalidates the sacrament itself. This Chakada said nothing of a kind. And they none, none of them speak about this. They accepted it at face value. Even Clarence Kelly from Society of Pius V who wrote about this, he actually dares to quote what Pius XII supposedly wrote. Except that in that in that uh, excerpt, when he quotes about this, he speaks of he uses it as a source publication that's published like four years after Pius XII died. Nothing authentic, and it's just a quotation. So it's, that's not sufficient. You cannot blame something that's uh, this serious on somebody who is already in a grave. Uh, the publications are published all of them as, as such after Pastor 12 died so during his lifetime and the publication that we have shown the, the screenshots of that short excerpt that's a book of church documents it was published in 1960 with the approval of the local bishop at that time and so in, in St. Mary's Kansas by the so-called Jesuits uh, and uh, it doesn't specify what Pastor 12 this is such a such an important part that one would think that they would publish what he actually says the, the essential form is. Now it speaks about the Holy Spirit and it speaks about that the sacrament has to be retained, that the church doesn't have the, the authority. That's the quoting the words of both Pilate the Twelve, that the church doesn't have the authority to change what Christ instituted. Well, Christ instituted that the Holy Ghost, he says so in the Holy Scripture. That's in Gospel of St. John chapter 20, verse 22. He read it on uh, the, the, that was the ten apostles, Judas already hanged himself and uh, that was after our, our Lord was risen and St. Thomas was not present and he came, our Lord came to the closed door and he uh, said, as my father has sent me, I also send you. Then he breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Ghost, who since he shall forgive, they have forgiven them. And that's how they received the Holy Ghost, because when God says, something it is factual it actually happens so that's the spirit of Christ our Lord and the spirit of God the Father so St. Augustine on that account quotes this passage and speaks a doctor of the church speaks about this and says that that's the grace of the sacrament of holy orders receive it the Holy Ghost and he breathed on them that's it so instead of imposing hands, that's the, well, that's the matter, but the grace comes through that imposition of hands and those words pronounced. When he breathed on them, our Lord says, receive the Holy Ghost. That's it. That's the essential form, confirmed by Council of Trent, Session 23, Canon 4. 
So now there's no such thing as claiming that the essential form has 16 words. That's not the case. But that's what I regarded it. And so since Archbishop Ga was silent about it, didn't say, well, that's not it. Because Council of Trent, what we have just explained, the Council of Trent teaches receive the Holy Ghost. That if anyone said that during the whole, uh, sacred ordination, which applies also to Episcopal consecration, the form is the same, with the exception that at or priest ordination it adds who sins he shall forgive them, forgive them in Latin, and so forth. Uh, so, uh, but the uh, so uh, instead of saying the Council of Trent defined it, or uh, not defined it because it's part of the review of faith, but protected it, stating it explicitly, and that uh, the, uh, if anyone said that the Holy, during sacred ordination the Holy Ghost is not given and therefore vainly do bishops say receive the Holy Ghost and so forth let him be anathema uh, so a bishop of the church with uh, theological canonical uh, uh, doctorate and uh, uh, history what they say of teaching in uh, prestige, prestigious uh, French University of Sorbonne uh, uh, cannot be teaching something else or allowed by silence to remain as the error of those whom he attempts to consecrate and that's the defect of intention you cannot permit this to exist moreover it's called a perpetual impediment uh, to ordinations that's not regarding the validity of the sacrament but the proof that he was a heretic and so perpetual that's canon law so he cannot accept somebody to ho holy orders for uh, especially not episcopal consecration that's the highest decree of the sacrament uh, in that sense the summum sacerdotium the summit the height of uh, priesthood is the episcopate and in that case he c those people cannot be accepted who are heretics and so they are forbidden to be ordained to a priesthood and, and consecrated bishops. But Archbishop Ngo disregarded that. The proof of this is whom he attempted to consecrate in Palma de Troya and, uh, and then in France, somebody who uh, was part of the old Catholic sect. This is horrendous history. It's so bad. But the proof that this is invalid in case of uh, Sanborn, but he's not a bishop, and worse than that, uh, is what this McKenna, this priceless video of McKenna, uh, that's his chapel, and in that video is visible as him. It's got the Last Supper on the front face of the altar. That invalidates the whole thing. That's a defect of intention. These people are heretics. Not only heretics, it's self evident that they don't understand what needs to be there as the essence of the sacrament. That means they are deceiving people to accept this falsehood as, as, this, as, as, uh, as if this was something permissible, permitted by the church, and it's not. On that account, the same thing as the chain reaction, same thing happens with Sanborn. And uh, so, not only denial of the infallible doctrine of the Vatican Council that Blessed Peter has perpetual line of successes. The set of accountists actually attempted to publish a version of that, uh, of this canon of the Vatican Council, uh, instead of saying perpetual line of, uh, that Blessed Peter has perpetual line of successes, they substituted the word has, which is a categorically, a categorical statement, uh, with should have. Uh, which uh, is creating ambiguity and furthering their uh, heresy of certificantism. This whole idea of certificantism, including this set of privationism, which is espoused by these evildoers, is concocted by the enemies of the church. That's the devil ultimately. So now the question is what was seen in that excerpt about the exorcism? That's a very interesting, very cunning uh, point of the devil himself. Because the devil was, it looks like that person was possessed. At least what this looks like. 
So let's take it, uh, if we take it in face value, the devil has no problem leave somebody. And this McKenna was truly ordained the priesthood. He was Dominican, he was truly ordained the priesthood because at least that's what it looks like because it was done at the, with the true right and, and at the time when the church was still, there was no, no sort of sect and he was in good standing, we assume. So, uh, that doesn't look like there was any defect at that moment. But to uh, to accept episcopate from a person who has history in 1970s of consecrating people from Palmar de Troya and old Catholic sect at, at taking at face value and so forth to have such history and, and not only that but what they what is published about Archbishop of God that he actually concelebrated the the Novozado Makori of God, which is Protestant heretical reenactment, idolatrous reenactment of the Last Supper. To accept sacraments from such person is mortally sinful, and shows that the person doesn't have there's no with the knowledge of the this principle of Saint Thomas Aquinas lays that heretical kind of progresses in the sacraments. Why would somebody who wants to be truly bishop, approach somebody for episcopal consecration of whom he has to be uh, convinced by just looking at what's taking place and him being present at the Second Vatican Garden of Heretics that that person is a heretic. That obviously to approach somebody for this kind of sacrament or any sacrament, even going to them to Mass for that purpose will only anger God and create a stain of mortal sin come with sacrilege. But this is what these people are doing. On that account, everything else falls. It's a, it's a chain, re chain reaction. Uh, so to answer that question, what we are speaking about, now the, the visibility of that grace that is uh, that is, was not granted in that video, uh, which is uh, exorcism video, visible. That's only visible what this person is saying. He was from England. And uh, so what was he saying? But then the little bit of history is presented in the description. And um, doesn't look like that he was anywhere inclined to be Catholic or anything in that sense. But the devil wants to use such people. Uh, in the description of the... In the it speaks about that the person uh, should go to confession and be absolved and so forth and then because the church knows that the heretic if you accept the heretic for for uh, this kind of ceremony that is will be fruitless the God will not help it belongs to him he will not help uh, to drive the devil away so what's the explanation let's say it was fa factually true that he was possessed this person was possessed by the devil uh, for that, the answer to that is how come it was successful, which they say was successful, when this McKenna it was a heretic. And the, 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 the answer to that is that the devil personally, the devil left him in order to further that heresy so that the doubt would be created, or at least the devil wanted to assure that what this McKenna was saying otherwise the, 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 the exorcism wouldn't be possible. See, the sacrament, it's a sacramental, God will not grant that. So to this disprove, to, to, to create this kind of a doubt about uh, this doctrine, that is in power doctrine of the church, is the objective of the devil, to lure people into that heresy of sedepicantism and sedeprivationism. But you see, the devil has no problem leaving such person and because that's just one person, so he can always enter him back and possess him again. It's just that for that purpose to demonstrate this, that's just to, what is visible, what is behind it, that's another point. These are heretics, they are enemies of the church, so they can concoct whatever they please. So it could be staged, it could be uh, published like this, but the bottom line is that Heretics cannot come for graces in the sacraments, they are the enemies of God outside of his church. And therefore God and, and 
Under normal circumstances, what this is will not grant that grace that the person would be helped to and, and belongs to God to give during exorcism. Exorcism is just a tool to drive the devil away. God has to do it. Now, another point is that during exorcism, there has to be used holy water. Uh, so, since these defects existed, holy water can only be obtained by the ministry of the bishop because you have to have holy chrism and so forth and that's only obtained by on holy thursday in holy week and it's part of the holy thursday mass and can only be, can only be obtained by valid and true bishop heretics cannot obtain any of this so um People who are outside the church, the grace and that the power and that and that oil and that holy chrism would not be granted by God. So there's no holy water per se in that sense. Because how do they obtain it? And that's essential for exorcism. Also, the, the victim has to be sprinkled with holy water. And the holy water so the devil is afraid. The devil is trembling, he wants to run out because he's Exercise the person that is exercised is sprinkled with holy water on any holy item that is used to touch, let's say, crucifix or uh, anything that's got that was blessed by the church. Devil receives burn from that because that holy item he can he can be around it, so he's afraid. The devil wants to run, but he's holding as long as possible on that person because the devil fears his superiors. In hell, that would be uh, he would be severely punished if he allowed that soul to go free. So he's struggling. That's recorded in the whole scripture. Our Lord uh, uh, had to do this and so forth, and himself, God. And so sometimes the exorcism, uh, the devil tear, the 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 void that was exercised and so forth was possessed by the devil, and our Lord had to cure the boy, and. Um, and, and so forth. So, uh, God permitted this to happen to them because these people are liars in front of them. That's truly a lie. In regards to this, Archbishop go to, to summarize this by our apostolic office, authority. Heretics uh, are outside the church and therefore such occurrences of their so-called ordinations and episcopal consecrations are doubtful in the sense who these people are. They are objectively doubtful when these kind of discrepancies exist. Then the burden of proof is on them. In this case, that is, is impossible to establish. What is possible to be established is their defect or intention which we have explained. What is ex uh, possible to establish the, the pictures that exist because these people obviously are hiding the whole thing. There's no picture or rep uh, evidence. Archbishop Go, in case of this Moises Carmona, had a phone on the altar that's visible. In the case of Gerard de Laurier, there was a still the phone, it's less visible, it's still there, you can see it, but it's on the, on the side. How can you be present and try to obtain? Episcopal consecration from a person who uh, allows these kind of defects to exist. A true Catholic would see just by looking at it that he's got a phone on the altar. That's saying like the sanctity of the place doesn't exist. Well then obviously this person is not serious what's taking place. How can it be? So there's no other place to put the phone so he has to have it on the altar. That's a disregard of the sanctity of the altar and, and so forth. This holy sacrifice of the Mass is supposed to take place. So uh, just by looking at it, ordinary person who would try to obtain this, this kind of sacrament, uh, would say, oh, well, that, that's something we cannot have anything to do with. That's it, turn around and walk away. Plus, the, the history of this Archbishop goes, so there's no way to approach such people for sacraments, in other words. So the grace is on up there, and that's for the prohibition of the church. So obviously both parties were guilty and, and heretics, and yes, they were. 
because this we explained that the the theory the set of privationist theory is totally heretical now so the sect doesn't have any authority in the church so they do not possess any authority to elect the pope they do not possess any authority and jurisdiction uh, even materially because that's 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 completely condemned by council council of the vatican so uh the, the pope after the election possesses the fullness of the power so obviously those who are heretics they cannot assemble to elect the pope and they cannot possess the keys to the kingdom of heaven so obviously that's impossible so there's no splitting the 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 authority the authority is one and a whole and not some kind of material and actual possession or something like that. that's that's a complete completely concocted falsehood and, and a heresy so was these people outside the church they these these heretics never mention it uh, uh, just because they're using the name of Catholic, this horrible no other sect, that doesn't mean that they are Catholic. No, they are not. They are outside the church. They don't have any authority, period. What these enemies of the church, including this Chicada, what he has said in that video, the proof is evident. That's a defect of intention. The proof that they didn't have is in twofold. That will be the last point. So he speaks about Gerard de Laurier and he speaks about. Uh, Carmona. So the video about Gerard, the, the, there's no video of that uh, about, about Gerard de Laurier. Yes, there's video of so-called Episcopal consecration of Mark Pivarunas, which was done by Moises Carmona. And in that video, it is evident that the grace of the sacrament was not granted. Moreover, that's invalid. Episcopal consecration. That is the line of so-called su succession, which today is uh, uh, his name of Dolan. He's in Ohio. But he was there with, with Chicada, and uh, he was tied with Sanborn. So they just have to Sanborn. That's McKenna, and and Dolan. That's and that means the the lawyer, and uh, uh, and Dolan, Daniel Dolan. That's uh, Carmona and Pivarunas. In that video of Pivarunas, it's self-evident that they, those people they understand what the essential form is because they say with Italian accent as cheap as as cheap as spiritual sacrament to be supposed to be, and laying of the hands. Except that Carmona permitted two people who are not bishops to be present and to participate in laying on the hands on top of. Mark Pivarunas, and that is totally opposed to what the sacrament is. If there's only one bishop, then one bishop suffices for validity, and so there's only one bishop laying the hands. That's it. No priest can participate because Council of Trent teaches, and that was the canon again, canon seven of session twenty-three. We have read this, but to to uh, present it again. Council of Trent, uh, that's a canon that forbids that, that the power of the priest is not equal to the power of the bishop. So if anyone says that that could be so, let him be anathema. Priests cannot participate in Episcopal consecration or for that manner uh, in that essential part of the um, priestly ordination because that the essential part is again a super spiritum sanctum and so forth, who since you shall be in so forth. Uh, and Episcopal Consecration, the essential form is a Sipa Spiritum Sanctum. The priest cannot participate in laying on the hands. The, the, the laying on the hands is a matter of the sacrament, and laying on the hands belongs at that essential part, the form and the matter itself that belongs to a valid, canonically sent bishop, not a priest. The priest, in that priestly ordination, then they lay hands on top of the head yes that's part of it but not episcopal consecration but that's what happened during Moises Kalman and Mark Pivarunas the proof that this was all fruitless that didn't happen is at the end of that video which is very striking because Mark Pivarunas is walking out and he gives blessing with two fingers which belongs to sovereign pontiff the bishop is only permitted with the whole hand like this not two fingers Consecrating Bishop then takes the Book of Gospels and with the assistance of the 
two assistant priests, places it open over the neck and shoulders of the bishop-elect. The book is then held by one of the chaplains kneeling behind the bishop-elect throughout this ceremony. This is not a bishop and this is not a bishop. Now the most important moment of the consecration, the imposition of hands. Acipe Spiritum Sanctum, receive the Holy Ghost. Having imposed hands, which is the essential matter of this sacrament, the bishop now begins the invitation to the preface. This is the proof that it's invalid. That's not part of the rite. That's not part of what the church allows. Simple priests cannot impose hands and say, Asipa Spiritum Sanctum, receive the Holy Ghost. That's not what it is allowed. The bishop has to do it by himself. The priests are not allowed to. They cannot act in that way. They can help with the uh, holding the uh, uh, the Book of Gospels and so forth and other things, but not that they will be part of the essential part of that sacrament. This is definitely defect of intention on his part. And that's it right here. See, that's him right here. So, that's, that's, there's no sacrament. They're mocking God, virtually. This is the mark of the enemy. After the Gloria, the bishop kisses the altar and then greets the congregation, Pax Vobis. Well, I don't know if there's any visibility of that altar, but that's major defect. And we'll see if it goes a little further. No, it's just a. It's not visible. Let's play it a little bit. Doesn't look like Oh wait a minute. Look at this. He blesses as a Pope. That's not how Bishop is allowed to bless. He has to have the whole hand. That's another defect. It'll play it back. That's very significant. So let's play it again. Episcopal blessing to the faithful. And look at this. So that's visible. Two hand, two two fingers. That's like the Pope. That's not allowed. Look at this. That's evident. That's a. And that's what Mark Pivanas does. And the history of the of the whole thing, how who they are, that they are ethics. So these are actually enemies of the church. Uh, but this we wanted to address this issue of celibacantism more thoroughly in this regard because it's truly really pernicious error, heresy, and plays on the feelings of the uh, and uh, of those who listen to it because the horrible sect of other sect is causing so much scandal and people obviously come to these kind of conclusions and still they are heretical one day our lord will restore his true catholic church and give us more faithful and put us into safety and that day these enemies of the church will wish that it had never come and uh, it will swallow them up and they will be very sorry that they have done so many evils to the Holy Mother Church spread so many poisonous heretical lies of Satan who is their true master among the people and thus 
uh, hampered and in some in many cases completely ruin their eternal salvation. These people are not Catholic in the sense of what they profess. They are actually heretics, they truly belong to the devil, and they are destroying souls. And the only way to oppose them is to stay away from them, help the church to continue her mission of salvation of souls. You can see that the works are done, that our Lord is helping the doctrine by his spirit that we do possess and is helping them is the Holy Ghost is with us and by our apostolic authority we do condemn all contrary statements or contrary um, or uh, or things that would be contradicting this our doctrine <coughs> and that would uh, neglect to accept it uh, in conscience as it is the ordinance of God and as it is part of our apostolic office of the suffering pastor of the church of the true Roman Catholic Church outside of which there is absolutely no salvation and therefore those who neglect to correct where they stand in front of God they will have to pay to him and he has all the consequences it is dogma divinely revealed outside the true Catholic Church and without a practice of the Catholic faith which is nothing else but Catholic tradition there's absolutely no salvation all heretics apostates or enemies of the church all schismatics all uh, communist socialists and so forth atheists which is the heresy of heresies all such people burn in hell and will burn in the hell if they die in such a state of their soul will not be one of them and the evil times are here